Hello again everyone from Tokyo, Japan and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera. Uh, I'm coming to you from indoors today where it's nice and warm and comfortable compared to outside. Uh, normally I don't mind going out on a cold day but uh, they're doing a lot of construction over by the park. Uh, a new junior high school is being built and they're doing I guess putting up the steel frame and such like that and it's quite noisy with the, the machinery and the riveting and all of that. <clears throat> uh, the schools here are built to be I guess very earthquake resistant and such and I think they're made mostly of metal with a little bit of concrete and glass mixed in. Uh, they take a long time to put up and they take a longer time to tear down but uh, uh, that's why I'm coming from to you from inside. Uh, the subject of today's video is another Olympus camera, uh, Olympus rangefinder camera. This particular one is the Olympus 35S. For those of you who are uh, new to my channel, I sell vintage Japanese cameras in my online stores, uh, japanvintagecamera.com, my Etsy store, which is also called Japan Vintage Camera, and I also have an eBay store. So if you're interested in buying this camera or another vintage Japanese camera, uh, please check out my stores. I'll post links to them in the description below the video. So the Olympus 35S, uh, there were a couple of variations of this camera made. One was made in the mid-1950s, and this particular version was made in the late 1950s. Uh, this one is more properly called the 35S II, uh, because it was the, I guess, second and improved version of the series. Uh, the body design was changed in the late 1950s, 1958 or 1959 or so, because the, the camera was uh, made uh, available with uh, another lens option, a uh, 35mm f2 option, and, and this particular version has the 42mm uh, f1.8. So the 35 f2 and uh, the 42 millimeter f1.8 have kind of a, I guess, a shallow depth of field when you are shooting them at wide apertures. So Olympus designed these cameras to have a more sophisticated uh, rangefinder to allow for more accurate focusing with these faster lenses. There are actually three different lenses available. Uh, this one has the f1.8 42 millimeter lens. You could also get uh, f2.8. 8 millimeter lens that was the or excuse me f2.8 lens that was the entry uh, level version and then there was the Olympus 35 wide and that was identical to this camera except for the 35 millimeter f2 lens uh, I used to uh, sell a few of the wide cameras I, I found them from time to time but recently uh, the, the value has gone kind of through the roof for these cameras about three or four years ago, a magazine here in Japan, Popular Photographers Magazine, did a write-up on the uh, Olympus Wide S. And uh, the lens, the 35mm f2 lens, which is an eight-element lens, uh, seemed to perform as well, if not better, than the 35mm f2 Somicron. And after this magazine or article was published, the price of these cameras kind of went through the roof here in Japan. So uh, they're a little bit hard to find here for what I consider a fair price, unless the camera's in really you know, crappy condition. So if you happen to come across one of these cameras overseas, uh, it's really a good performer and uh, uh, you should hold on to it. Uh, the 35S is the identical camera, uh, just with uh, the 42 millimeter lens. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the features and functions and controls of the 35S, uh, starting at the top here. Uh, here we have the film rewind knob, and Olympus added kind of a little uh, spring-loaded catch here to pop open the knob. And they put this handy little roller on the end, which makes it very smooth and easy to use. Over here we have the uh, shoe for mounting a flash gun. It's a cold shoe of course, and to operate a flash on this camera you'll need to plug in a sync cord to the sync socket here on the bottom of the lens. Over here we have the shutter release button which is uh, threaded for a standard cable release. Here we have the film winding and uh, shutter charging lever. And it's actually quite smooth. Uh, and Makes a nice, uh, I guess, ratcheting sound. And here we have the film counter dial. On the back of the camera, we have the viewfinder window. And as I said, uh, this camera featured an improved uh, rangefinder system, though the window here is kind of small, very similar to the earlier camera. What is really cool about these cameras is this little computer located on the back, which is, uh, I guess, a light value computer, which allows you to set the exposure uh, controls on the camera without needing 
I guess, a, a standard light meter or nowadays a light meter app. <clears throat> what you can do is just look at the different lighting conditions on the top here. They have these uh, handy pictures. And you can, with this little computer, you can kind of program uh, the film speed you have loaded in. And by looking at these and working the dial, you can kind of figure out uh, what light value to use and the light value system uh, there's a light value indicator located here on in this window on the top of the lens so very similar to the old Rolex flexes and some of the older film cameras uh, from back in the days when I guess a uh, light powered light meters weren't commonly available uh, I sometimes see the old mechanical light value or light meter computers, and these have become kind of collector's items here in Japan, especially the more, I guess, well-made ones. And they are very similar to this, maybe, but a bit more sophisticated. Uh, you, you, you preset your, uh, I guess, film speed, and then looking at the different conditions, turn the dials, and it gives you a fairly accurate, uh, I guess, reading and a method to set the exposure with. On the bottom of the camera here we have the release button which unlocks the winding mechanism and allows you to rewind the film. And here we have a standard quarter inch tripod socket. Uh, all the important controls of course are located on the front of the camera since this is a fixed lens rangefinder camera. Uh, right here we have the self timer and self timer seems to be kind of an option on these cameras. I, I've come across these cameras all made in the same year. Some come with a self timer, some do not. And this particular one has the self timer. On the back here you have the focusing tab uh, which is arranged in meters. And in front of that, you have the depth of field scale, which tells you how much depth of field you have at any given aperture. In front of this, we have the uh, shutter speed dial. Uh, this is one of the, the rapid shutters, which has a maximum speed or a minimum speed, however you want to uh, define that, the one five hundredth of a second. And of course, here is the light value window, which I mentioned before. And on the very front here, we have the ring for adjusting the aperture. So very similar to uh, other rangefinder cameras. The viewfinder in this camera is quite good. It has projected frame lines, like some of the more sophisticated uh, rangefinder cameras, which came along later, and uh, also features parallax correction, which is a pretty good feature. Uh, loading the film in the camera is quite easy. You simply lift up on the latch here on this side, and the film door pops open. Uh, you would lift up on the forks here, popping up the film rewind knob, and drop your film canister inside, and then push down. You might have to wiggle it a little bit for it to seat all the way downward. And then stretch your film meter across the back opening here, and feed it into the uh, take-up spool, and simply wind uh, the shutter and uh, push the shutter button until the film comes all the way across and the holes on the top and bottom of the film are lined up with these teeth on this take-up gear. Uh, once that is set, you simply close the film door. Make sure to push down the latch all the way. Uh, if you don't push it down all the way, you run the risk of the door popping open, which is not good when you have the film loaded in the camera. And then you simply wind the camera until the number one lines up with a little red mark which you'll see at the top inside here of the film counter window. And overall these are a, a very good camera. Uh, they do have some problems which I see uh, from time to time. Uh, one problem they have is sometimes the uh, focus helicoid becomes stuck and on this particular camera it's not especially too easy to uh, unstick the helicoid but you kind of can. if. Uh, if you look inside here, around the edges in the back, there's kind of a gap here. And if you look inside, you can kind of see the brass uh, helicoid gears. Uh, what you can do to fr free up a frozen helicoid is to put some very thin oil. Uh, some, maybe something a little bit thinner than uh, WD-40 if you can find it. Uh, put it around the uh, brass, brass uh, I guess, helicoid gears. Use a fair amount of oil and then just let the camera sit overnight, like in this position with the lens down, so the oil kind of soaks in. And after it's had uh, time to soak, uh, just give uh, the focusing ring a good twist. And that'll usually knock it loose and it'll start working again. Uh, the shutter in these can sometimes uh, stick 
as well uh, due to oil getting on the shutter blades. I made a video about uh, how to unstick the shot shutter blades in a Konica uh, camera. Uh, the same advice works for this, but uh, you need to remove the front lens element kind of like on the inside here. With a rubber stopper or something, you can kind of push here and the front lens element will, group will come out and allow you to get access to the shutter blades. Uh, it's been a while since I've had one of these cameras. Uh, if you can't access on the front, uh, it's, it is kind of possible to take it off the back, but the front is of course the better option. Uh, overall, these are an excellent camera, very high quality materials and workmanship, like most of the Japanese cameras from the, the mid-1950s. Before they got the... Uh, in the 1960s, they became more sophisticated, and uh, I guess there were higher quality electronics and optical coatings, but uh, they became cheap when it came to uh, the exterior materials. The, the stamped top and bottom covers became thinner, and they used more plastic and such. Uh, the 50s cameras were more durable and much more mechanical and, and quite solid, and I usually prefer these cameras over the later versions, though some of the later versions are quite nice. Uh, this camera feels really good in the hand. I like the viewfinder and rangefinder system. And the lens in these is an excellent performer. Uh, this lens was uh, introduced with this camera. The earlier version had an f1.9 lens. This one increased the speed a little bit. And it was good enough of a lens, which they uh, continued to put it in uh, a few of the subsequent models. So uh, overall, an excellent camera. Uh, as I said, I have I sell vintage Japanese cameras. I believe I have this one listed for sale right now in my Etsy store. I still have the original lens cap for this particular one. And I also have the, the leather case for it. So uh, once again, if you're interested in this camera, it's available for sale right now, or at least at the time that I'm making this video. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and I hope you tune in again soon.